Silent cinema can seem impenetrable and quaint to a lot of movie buffs, and this is no surprise as its heyday came to an end over 90 years ago. However, for anyone interested in film history or the artistry of the medium, at least a cursory knowledge of silent film is essential. The problem is that silent movies are vastly different from modern ones in terms of style. The acting isn't as naturalistic since the actors could only give a performance with their face and body language. The pace is often slower, and of course you have to read the dialogue on intertitles that break up the action instead of just listening to the actors. So how can a newcomer overcome these obstacles? In my opinion, the genre of silent film that holds up the most and is easily accessible to today's audiences is clearly comedy. Of course, the emphasis is on visual and physical comedy, which helps make the humor feel timeless. In terms of where to start with comedy from this era, to me there's a clear choice, and that's the legendary actor, writer, and director Charlie Chaplin. He was a master at slapstick comedy, but still imbued his films with real emotion and at times political messages. Chaplin was strongly associated with his bumbling but kind character known as the Tramp, recognizable for his iconic look that included a mustache and a bowler hat. The character was featured in Chaplin's 1921 film The Kid, his first feature as director. Despite being his full-length debut, it was loved by audiences and critics alike at the time, as well as in the decades since. The Kid even has a perfect 100% score from critics on Rotten Tomatoes. The Gold Rush from 1925 is another one of his finest films that came out during the height of his popularity and also featured Chaplin as the Tramp. Chaplin was one of the very few that continued to make silent movies even after the quick rise of sound in 1927 and 28. These were just as well received, especially the 1931 film City Lights, which is ranked number 11 in the 2007 list of the best films ever made from the American Film Institute. While not truly silent as it had a synchronized score and sound effects, it did use intertitles in place of dialogue. This also applies to Modern Times from 1936, where Chaplin's social commentary became much more explicit in dealing with the Great Depression. Another icon of silent comedy was actor-director Buster Keaton, who wasn't as popular as Chaplin when he was active, but has been massively influential since. He was known for having a stone-faced, deadpan look that contrasted with the ridiculous situations he got into. A great place to start with Keaton is The General from 1926, which is set during the Civil War. It's full of impressive spectacle, notably in the climactic train wreck sequence. The General wasn't well received when it came out, but has since seen its reputation vastly improved. For instance, the prestigious critics group Sight and Sound has ranked it as high as number 8 on their list of the greatest films of all time. Sherlock Jr. is another Keaton classic and was number 62 on AFI's list of the 100 best comedies. More popular than Keaton at the time, but slightly less remembered today, is slapstick comedian Harold Lloyd. His most well-known movie is Safety Last, which features possibly the most iconic image of silent cinema, Lloyd hanging off a clock on the side of a skyscraper. Other important silent comedians include Harry Langdon, Fatty Arbuckle, and Max Sennett. The famous duo Laurel and Hardy also began their careers in the late silent era. Another genre of silent film that's relatively accessible to modern viewers is horror. Silent horror has a lot of creative visuals and often the creepiness still holds up. A perfect example is the most pivotal one of all, Nosferatu. The 1922 film was ostensibly an original story, but was clearly a ripoff of the Bram Stoker novel Dracula, leading his estate to successfully sue for copyright infringement. A judge even ordered that all prints of Nosferatu needed to be destroyed, so we're lucky we can even watch it. Nosferatu is part of the movement dubbed German Expressionism, which was related to the larger Expressionist art style that began in painting, theater, and other art forms. In Expressionist cinema, sets are often quite exaggerated or distorted in some way, and the performances were over the top to match. However, the quintessential German Expressionist film was The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. It's about a madman, and the highly unrealistic and stylized sets do a great job of putting the audience in his mindset. The Phantom of the Opera from 1925 is the most famous American silent horror movie. 
It was distributed by Universal Pictures, who became strongly associated with horror monsters in the 1930s with Dracula, the Mummy, and Frankenstein. The Phantom of the Opera was sort of a precursor to those films and featured one of the most well-known roles from horror legend Lon Chaney. His look as the title character is among the most unforgettable in all of silent film. From there, I'd also recommend some science fiction, as like with horror, it can have some interesting imagery. An absolute must-watch is A Trip to the Moon from 1902. It's good for beginners partly due to its sub-20-minute runtime, as it was produced prior to the advent of what we now consider feature-length films. In the short, scientists travel to the moon and are attacked by aliens. Like many of director Georges Méliès's films, it uses stop-motion effects that of course seem primitive today, but were revolutionary in cinema's infancy. A Trip to the Moon contains some striking visuals and remarkable color that was hand-painted frame by frame. The most renowned science fiction feature of the era is easily Metropolis, an undeniably beautiful film with unique, powerful visuals. Made by the prolific German director Fritz Lang, Metropolis is a part of German Expressionism just like Nosferatu or Caligari. Like others in the movement, the movie utilizes heavily stylized, beautiful sets, in this case to portray a futuristic city. One way in which Metropolis is accessible is that it uses few intertitles, and the story is mainly told visually. Also, the memorable design of the robot Maria was the inspiration for many films, including C-3PO from Star Wars. And that's just one of the many ways that Metropolis changed science fiction cinema forever. Similarly, the genre of animation is visually stimulating, and almost all the animated films from the silent period were under 40 minutes. You could begin with the amusing humorous phases of Funny Faces from 1906 that is generally considered the first animated film. It's only three minutes long, so you have nothing to lose by checking it out. Likewise, the work of American animator and cartoonist Windsor McKay was fun and lighthearted. I recommend the adorable Gertie the Dinosaur from 1914 or Little Nemo from three years earlier. Both are under 15 minutes long and combine live action with animation. Additionally, there are some documentaries I'd say are suitable for newcomers. Although it blurs the line between fiction and documentary, the creepy and bizarre Hoxon, or as it was called in English, Witchcraft Through the Ages, is definitely one of them. It was much more graphic than you might expect from this time period, so much so that it was banned in the United States. Another interesting silent documentary is Nanook of the North, which also combines reality with artifice. Despite much of the film being staged or fictionalized, it's still an interesting look at the indigenous people of Canada and was seminal for the documentary genre. Many surrealist works of the time are easy to get into, partly due to just how bizarre they are. The most significant is Un Chien Andalou, the first film by one of the all-time greats, director Louis Bunuel. It was also co-written by a household name of the art world, Salvador Dali. The 21-minute film disregards all logic and gave us the infamous shot of a razor slicing an eyeball. Other interesting examples include anemic cinema from French painter and sculptor Marcel Duchamp, who is crucial to both the Dada and Cubist movements, and Emac Bakia in Return to Reason, both directed by American artist Man Ray. While dramas might be the least accessible genre of silent film for beginners, there are definitely at least a few that might be suitable. One of these is the French film The Passion of Joan of Arc, which is one of the best movies, silent or otherwise, largely due to the captivating performance from lead Maria Falconetti that's emphasized with powerful lingering close-ups. Another great drama is Sunrise, The Song of Two Humans from F.W. Murnau, the director of Nosferatu. It features some bits of experimentation like double exposure and presenting the intertitles in a unique artistic way. Battleship Potemkin from Russian director Sergei Eisenstein is undeniably essential when it comes to film history and is relatively accessible due to its forward-looking montage editing. The Odessa Steppe sequence is up there with the most important sequences in all of cinema and has been referenced in other movies dozens of times. The films of American director D.W. Griffith are crucial to film history, but hardly something I'd suggest to a newcomer to silent cinema. His biggest film was easily The Birth of a Nation from 1915, but not only is it insanely racist as it portrays the KKK as heroes, it's also incredibly long with a whopping runtime of 195 minutes. 
In fact, it was the longest film ever made when it was released. And while it was incredibly influential on a technical level, it's not nearly as entertaining as the previous movies I've mentioned. You also can't go wrong checking out the various short films since it's not much of a time commitment. Many of the significant works from 1910 or earlier are 20 minutes or less. Inventor Thomas Edison was a key innovator in the early years, and he had the first film production studio. The Lumiere brothers made some of the earliest documentaries and were the first to have a commercial and public projection of a film in 1895. Also, the aforementioned Georges Melier made hundreds of entertaining shorts. Edwin S. Porter's The Great Train Robbery from 1903 is only 12 minutes long and transformed editing forever with its daring use of cross-cutting. Keep in mind that any movie made before 1924 is in the public domain, so they are often available to watch online for free. If you're into film history, watching silent movies is a no-brainer. If you're a filmmaker or hope to be, watching silence can be a great way to think about the craft from a different perspective. And if you're interested in general history, they can be a fascinating time capsule of society over a century ago. If you can keep an open mind and get over the stylistic differences, I think you'll see that silent films can compete with those from any other time period when it comes to quality. That'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe.